You're basically telling people, take pain pills, get steroid injections, and then go to a PT to have them massage and rub you a little bit. They weren't even talking about having a home-based exercise program in the first draft. Today, I'm gonna be pulling back the curtain on some tricks that are being used in orthopedic surgery research to make surgery look a lot better than it really is. Once you see how these tricks work, you're gonna understand how to protect yourself from these games in the future. So today, I'm gonna to talk about the PHT, or Personalized Hip Therapy, protocol. I'm going to explain who created it, what it is, why it turned out so badly, and how it's being used to trick people into getting a surgery that doesn't even work that well. So if you're ready, let's get ready to think right, move right, and feel right. So let's jump right into it. I'm going to leave links to the source material in the description box so you can see everything for yourself. In case you're not familiar with the idea of hip impingement or FAI, it's a diagnosis that orthopedic surgeons invented in the late 90s and early 2000s. The surgery has exploded in popularity despite there being a serious lack of evidence that the theory even holds any water. The basic premise is that the shapes of your bones are causing restriction in range of motion. For some reason, your bones are growing allegedly too big in various places. It could be along the rim of the socket, it could be along the ball of your hip joint, it could be both. The surgical idea is that if you go in there, open things up and cut down that bone, you're gonna cure somebody's hip mobility problems and cure their hip pain. Is that really true? Good question. In multiple large-scale studies that follow athletes all the way into their senior age, meaning into their 50s, 60s, and 70s, there has been no link shown between FAI bone shapes and the development of hip pain, hip mobility issues, or arthritis. Sounds like the theory doesn't make sense. That is clearly what the science says, but surgeons keep looking for reasons why that might not be true, and they keep coming out with studies like this one, which aim to prove that surgery is a great option and better than doing exercise like you would in physical therapy. Which means we now have to talk about the PHT, or Personalized Hip Therapy Protocol, which was used in two randomized controlled trials, one in the UK and one in Australia, to compare hip surgery versus physical therapy for people who have hip pain and the FAI bone shapes. But I thought you said the bone shapes don't matter. I did, but again, these surgeons don't really care about that evidence. They're looking to compare compare the treatments, so let's just do that. This paper published in 2016 details the process of how the PHT was developed and who was involved. The lead author to this study and one of the key drivers behind the development of the PHT is an orthopedic surgeon who, as of today, focuses on performing hip surgeries on young athletes. Did you say the lead author is a surgeon? Yes, according to his online profile, he's a specialist in young adult hip surgery. He and a team of physical therapists created PHT to use in randomized controlled trials to compare the best conservative care to hip surgery. Wouldn't a surgeon want PT to fail? Why would a surgeon want PT to fail? Why would you suggest something like that? I mean, if PT succeeds, then you have fewer surgeries. I would never have thought of that. Good thinking, Boney. But let's look at the actual PHT to see if there's actually some bias which you are implying. There are four key components to the PHT protocol. The first is an accurate assessment. You wanna take a full history, look at whether you have hip stability issues, check your strength, your range of motion in your leg, and in your hip joint. Core piece number two, which is very important, is patient education and advice. And in this section specifically, they want to make sure that when you as a patient have hip pain and have the bone shapes, that you understand that those bone shapes are a problem and that you should avoid any activities that might put you into stressful positions or create more pain. This is a topic we will return to later. Core number three is that you should use painkillers to help with pain relief so that you can do your exercises and just get through your day. We'll also look at this core component later because it is really problematic and it also shows that there may have been some bias issues like Boney here implied. I was just thinking out loud. I know Boney, but you really have to give people the benefit of the doubt. Core component number four sounds amazing. A home-based program where you are learning exercises and gradually progressing and improving range of motion, strength, and stability sounds perfect. But the devil is in the details and we're gonna be looking at that. When you take just a brief look at the PT program, you can see that there are already some major issues. For example? For example, you have a maximum of 10 physical therapy contacts in this six month physical therapy program. What that means is in the first three months, you're supposed to have six sessions of PT. But in this protocol, it's not actual sessions. What is a not actual session? That's a good question. In this protocol, 
Three of your sessions are supposed to be in person and because they're being done in the NHS, that means they'd be around 30 minutes each. The other three sessions during that first three months can be done by phone or email. Wait, how do you do a session over phone or email? Which is why they call these contacts because a session over phone or email is not really a session, it's just a contact to basically encourage the patient and tell them to keep doing their homework. And over the next three months, you can have up to four booster sessions or contacts since they can be done in person, over the phone, or by email. Um, so you could actually just have three sessions? Yeah, you could actually have three sessions and then seven phone calls or seven emails with your physical therapist and that would be pretty good best conservative care. Okay, but wait, there are also 24 exercises that the physical therapists who are doing the PhD protocol with patients get to choose from and they can use these 24 exercises to help the patients figure out what they need and to address their hip mobility challenges. In addition, all the PTs that participated in this study received one full day, one full day of training in these 24 exercises. Uh, this doesn't really sound that great. Don't worry, it gets a whole lot better and I'm gonna explain some more details right after I give you an important analogy that will help you understand what's about to happen. Let's pretend we're in an alternate reality and I am a representative of a pharmaceutical company called mm, Modizer. Yeah, Modizer. So I have a drug called Salafibrite that I think is very effective in treating brain tumors. In fact, I've done a study that shows that Salafibrite is much more effective than the best alternative treatment for brain cancer. So if you have brain cancer, you're gonna wanna use Salafibrite. Um, so what was the alternative in your study? It was this. Um, uh, what? Like this, see? Wait, seriously? No, okay, I was just kidding. You actually use a pad so you don't injure the skull itself, but this vibration actually stimulates hormone secretions that protect you from brain cancer. Where did you come up with that? Well, we got consensus from a team of experts that we pay and they all came up with this as a good alternative. And back to reality. That analogy may seem kind of extreme, but it's only a slightly comedically exaggerated example of what's really going on. If you've designed a trial to compare two different treatments and one of those treatments is designed to fail, you're going to end up seeing success with the other treatment. In other words, PHT is designed to fail and I'm gonna go into the details to show you exactly why it fails to deliver any significant benefit to the patients who underwent it. Now, before I jump into all the problems with PHT, I wanna be very clear that the problems that showed up do not necessarily mean that people have bad intentions. This doesn't mean that the surgeons involved in developing this program deliberately wanted to create a bad program, but their biases and their understanding of human anatomy and how the musculoskeletal system functions follows a certain line of thinking. It follows in the orthopedic surgeon's tradition, which is to just focus on bones. They're looking for structures that they can surgically fix, but they aren't seeing the bigger picture, which is that muscles are the things that actually move. In other words, muscles are the organ of movement. They pull your bones in different positions and directions. So to say that the bones are the problem when you have a movement problem is to completely ignore the primary mover of your bones. So now let's look at the four major problems with the PHT. The first one is the time constraints and expectations are completely out of line with reality. Earlier, we talked about the physical therapy schedule. There are a minimum of three sessions that you get in the first three months that are in person. All of the other sessions, that means three more sessions, could be by phone or email, which means you're not getting actual direct supervision, coaching, guidance, or anything. Over the second six month period, you only get four more contacts, which could be PT sessions, but they could also be phone or email. And if you are trying to help somebody move better, that's simply not enough time. A minimum of 90 minutes over the course of three months is not going to change somebody in a significant way. Even if you're a patient in this trial and you got 10 sessions of PT and they were all in person, you probably still only got five hours of total contact time with somebody in person. If you have ever done anything to try to improve your own hip, shoulder, or spine mobility, you know that it takes time and often takes a lot of analysis, coaching, and observation to understand how to move your body properly. 
a handful of PT sessions where the PT might be just doing taping or giving you a massage or some sort of muscle activation technique means you are not getting enough time to learn how to move your hips better. The second big problem with the personalized hip therapy protocol is that the patient education component guarantees that the patient is gonna see their physical therapy as a big waste of time. Wait, what do you mean by that? One of the big core components is to give patients advice about activities of daily living to avoid FAI meaning they told the patients that they should avoid deep flexion, adduction, and internal rotation of the hip. Wait, what does that even mean? Flexion is bringing the femur closer to the chest, closing off this angle. Adduction is bringing the thigh across the midline in this direction. And internal rotation is when you create this twist. Combining those motions is called the fader test when you go flexion, adduction, internal rotation, and it often causes hip pain in people who don't have FAI bone shapes. I already did a video that debunks the fader test, which you can watch after you finished watching this video. The main point is that patients were told that the cause of their hip pain was the bone shapes and that they needed to avoid positions that were painful because that would just create more damage to the bones. In other words, they're telling these patients that you have a bone problem. It is a bone problem and we're not actually going to fix the bone problem with non-surgical methods we're just going to help you manage your pain the authors of this study even note in this paper that they chose exercises just based on what pts said would be good to include and not based on exercises that would actually address people's functional limitations which brings me to the third big issue which is the exercise selection and the guidance and restrictions on movements is ridiculous because the authors of the pht start with the belief that bone shapes are are the problem, they have put a hard ban on doing any painful hard end range stretches. They also included no exercises that will stretch the hamstrings, no exercises that would stretch the inner thigh, no exercises that really stretch the quads, no exercises that strengthen the adductors, no exercises that strengthen really much of anything. I'm gonna talk about the exercises in more detail later in this video, but first I wanna explain the fourth major issue, which was the use of painkillers and steroid injections to manage pain. If you've watched my videos before, you've probably heard me say, don't get caught in rips, rest, ice, injections, pills, and surgery. In this case, they're using pills and injections to numb your pain. And when you numb things, you can't tell what you're doing, whether what you're doing is helping. So let's say you started with PHT and you said, hey, I've got some hip pain and it's hard to do the exercises you're assigning and they say, take some painkillers or don't worry, we can do a little injection and you won't be able to walk for a couple days, but don't worry, it's gonna kill the pain. Those first three months where you have three physical therapy sessions are gonna be wasted while you are numb to the sensations and you are unable to figure out what's going on and what you're feeling and what exercises and stretches might be helping. The use of painkillers to manage pain was something that was in the very first draft of this protocol, meaning the first draft that the orthopedic surgeon and his team of PTs put together. And despite the fact that a majority of the PTs giving feedback disagreed with keeping that in the protocol, it was kept in the protocol. I'm not making that up. It's on page four where they talk about the use of analgesics and how only 44% of physiotherapists agreed that it should be in the program. But I thought it was a consensus model. Well, I guess it's just like any voting system where some people have a little more say than others. That doesn't really seem like consensus. You're right, it's not really, but what are you gonna do? There are certain biases inherent in the core group and they manage to push their biases into the eventual protocol. On the plus side, the consensus model did actually make the program better than it would have been if we had just gone with what the orthopedic surgeon and his PT said. Can you give me an example? Yeah, the first draft was actually two to three weeks of physical therapy with three to four sessions, lasting on average 30 minutes each. And they suggested that you use painkillers for up to two weeks to manage pain. Wait, that means using painkillers for the entire treatment time? Yes, according to this first draft, you would just use painkillers and just do a couple sessions of PT for about three weeks and then that would be the end of your treatment. That sounds terrible. That is terrible. If you look at that as the first draft, you realize what you're starting with when you're creating this best conservative care. 
The Cora Group's opening bid is one that is obviously designed to fail. You're basically telling people, take pain pills, get steroid injections, and then go to a PT to have them massage and rub you a little bit. They weren't even talking about having a home-based exercise program in the first draft. After multiple revisions, they went from that three weeks of painkillers and PT to six months with 10 sessions, but only three of them have to actually be in person. So really it's only a minimum of three sessions and then you can have seven contacts by phone or email, which as we've mentioned is stupid. They also added in using Kinesio Tape to help patients with postural education, which I'm sure the Kinesio Tape company was very happy about. And they also ended with 24 exercises to choose from to help people with hip pain and FAI bone shapes. And I almost forgot, there are some additional optional things that you can do in the PHT. The PHT considered it optional to treat coexisting low back pain. Now to be clear, that means they're saying that low back pain is a coexisting condition that has nothing to do with your hip function, which is to say that the muscles that are around your butt, the muscles around your thigh, are somehow not influencing the position of your pelvis and lower back. This again suggests a stunning lack of understanding of biomechanics. If you think your butt and hip and abs don't affect how your low back feels, you do not understand how the human body works. Well, what's in the 24 exercises? Great question. Maybe the 24 exercises are amazing. Maybe they're really effective at helping people with hip pain. Let's take a look. In the randomized controlled trial that they used PHT in, and PHT did worse than surgery in the short term. It did also cause some knee and back pain in some patients, but they didn't exactly say that the PHT caused that problem. If we look carefully at these 24 magic exercises, we can understand what's really going on. Some stated goals of these exercises are to train pelvic and hip stabilization, meaning glutes and abs. They wanted to target the glute max, glute medius, and the short external rotators and the lower limb in general. They also are very clear that they want the PTs to progress these exercises so that they get harder, that they get more stability, more strength for their patients. They trained all the PTs participating in this trial at a one day workshop. One day, huh? I know, one day. But don't worry, these 24 magic exercises don't really take more than one day to learn and you'll see why in a second. Hey, I wanna give a shout out to some new Patreon patrons. Barry, Aaron, Andy, Pam, John, and Linda. Thank you all so much for becoming $5 monthly Patreon patrons. If you wanna support me too, you can use the PayPal or Patreon links you'll find in the description box, or you can use the join and thanks buttons you'll find on YouTube. Thanks so much for your support, now let's get back to it. First of all, it's not actually 24 home-based exercises. Wait, I thought you said it's 24 exercises for the PTs to use. If you look at exercise 23, it's an anterior capsule hip mobilization, which is not an exercise a patient can do at home by themselves. It's something that a PT would do to them or a massage therapist or somebody else to help them stretch out the front of their hip. How this got included in a set of exercises that are supposed to be assigned to patients, I don't know. The PHT is supposed to be comprised of progressible exercises, exercises you can make harder so that your patient gets stronger and gets more range of motion and more control. So let's look at how that actually plays out in the PHT. Exercise one is the gym ball exercise where you're sitting on a yoga ball and you are rocking forward and back and side to side. The instructions for the PT say you can customize this for the patient and progress it with duration, frequency, repeats, and addition of a TheraBand, etc. The extra option listed here is to lift one foot from the floor while maintaining your balance and keeping good symmetrical posture on the ball, and then you relax and repeat on alternating legs. Great, that's a tiny little bit of progression that'll teach that patient to use their core a little bit, but there's no resistance to the actual core muscles. There's just a little bit of stability training going on. No real serious progression. And yes, your ankle and leg muscles work a little bit harder to do this on one leg, but it's still not gonna be significant. If we go to the back of the PHT, we get to exercise 22, which just made it in at the end stage of revision, and that is a really hard exercise. Just kidding, it's actually just a pelvic tilt exercise and you sit on the edge of your bed, a table, a chair, whatever, and you practice going into anterior tilt and posterior tilt. They want you to practice using the muscles in your low back that get you into anterior tilt and then relax them and shift back into posterior tilt. On the prescription sheet, they're telling you to hold for a blank number of seconds, which means you could obviously 
progress this exercise by holding it longer. The only problem is training yourself to hold this position with anterior tilt for long periods of time will lead to back pain and reduced hip mobility. Is it then any wonder that one of the adverse events of this training protocol was low back pain? And again, this sheet reminds you that you can progress this for the patient by playing with duration, frequency, repeats, and the addition of a TheraBand, etc. These two exercises have no real serious progression available for them. But what about the other exercises? Well, exercise number two is an abdominal exercise. You lie on your back, draw your belly button down towards the spine, keep your pelvis still, and keep breathing. That is the whole exercise. Again, remember that you can customize and progress this by playing with duration, frequency, repeats, and the addition of a TheraBand, etc. What about exercise three? In exercise three, we do that same abdominal activation technique and then we let our leg fall out while still maintaining core control and then bring the leg back in. In the instructions, it says to keep the muscle in the front of your hip relaxed, but it doesn't actually tell you which muscle they're talking about. And by the way, there are multiple muscles in the front of your hip. Repeat blank times on each leg, which means we can play with the progression by adding more repetitions of this really weak, gentle exercise. And don't forget, there's that whole thing about duration, frequency, repeats, and the TheraBand, etc. Exercise nine is a stability exercise, and you stand like this, put your hands on your hips, and externally rotate on top of that leg. And then slowly bring yourself back to the start position. While you're doing this, you want your glutes to stay engaged on your stance leg, and just make sure it stays engaged throughout the whole motion without losing your balance. Hold for blank seconds and repeat blank times, so we can progress it that way in addition to all those other things, etc. But again, we're not actually increasing the demand on specific muscles. Just holding this for a little bit longer is gonna challenge the muscles a little bit more, but it's not actually gonna encourage muscle growth. It's not gonna make any significant changes to the strength in these glute muscles. Exercise 11 is actually a challenging exercise and could be progressed if you knew what you were doing. You stand like this, and according to the crude drawing, put your hands on your hips, take a step forward, and bend your knees. That's how detailed these instructions are. Once you do this, you return to the start position and then repeat blank number of times. If you're somebody with hip mobility issues and you're generally atrophied and weak and don't do a lot of exercise, this is gonna be really hard. I'm thinking of the people who are like 50, 60 years old who have lived their lives in chairs and don't have the control and the strength to be able to do this safely. In the PhD, there is no information about how to regress this exercise for somebody who doesn't have the strength to complete the full range of motion. There's nothing about using assistance. There are no guidelines about what is an appropriate level of challenge. It also doesn't include any information on how you might progress the exercise for somebody who has already mastered the basic version of the exercise, but that's probably okay because if you have hip pain, doing this exercise, even if you are strong, is probably gonna make things worse for you. Why would it make it worse? If you're somebody who's already kind of athletic and active and you have well-developed thigh muscles and you've been doing a lot of running, jumping, or you've been lifting weights, you probably have certain movement patterns that are already ingrained in the muscles around your hips. Unless you're an outlier who's been doing really specific flexibility and mobility training, you already have quads that pull you into anterior pelvic tilt and that trap your hips into a reduced range of motion. The quads, by the way, are the thigh muscles here that attach to your knee and attach to the front of your pelvis. Continuously training the forward lunge without paying attention to the balance of the muscles around your hip is going to result in you being trapped here, which is gonna hurt your hips more and make your low back sore. In addition, if you've already been doing a lot of stuff like biking and running and making these muscles work a lot, doing forward lunges without having done any massage or stretching work is just going to increase the likelihood that you have discomfort and pain in your knee. Um, wasn't knee pain one of those adverse events? Yes, knee pain is one of those adverse events that showed up with the PHT and it shouldn't be a mystery that it could possibly be from poor exercise choice and selection. Which brings me to my favorite exercise in the whole program, number 13, the VMO exercise. The VMO is a muscle that's right here on your thigh. It helps you extend your knee joint. If you want the VMO to get stronger, you have to train a motion like knee extension against resistance. That may mean sitting down with an ankle weight or it could be doing squats with your heels elevated. So listen to these instructions. Lean sideways against the wall, standing on your operated leg. Wait, did you just say operated leg? 
Yes, it says operated leg because they just cut and paste this from some other post-operative PT program. And then it says, bend the non-affected leg up against the wall in front of you. Use the non-affected leg to push against the wall while keeping your balance with the muscles of the operated leg. Hold for a blank seconds and repeat blank times. Now you're looking at me standing here against the wall wondering how come you're not doing anything with your knee joint and the answer is because it's not in the instructions. This so-called VMO exercise doesn't work the VMO at all. And I want to remind you that this protocol went through many revisions and many physical therapists saw this and signed off on it and somehow an exercise called VMO exercise doesn't do anything for the VMO. I wish I could have been in the room during that one day training when a whole group of physical therapists was being taught the VMO exercise that doesn't work the VMO. So let's say you're somebody who has hip pain and on the hip impingement tests like Fader and Faber, you notice that you get pain. Would this exercise protocol have anything to help you? The answer is no. There are only two stretches in the entire protocol. One is a kneeling hip flexor stretch, which you're guaranteed to get wrong, especially if you only have three PT sessions of 30 minutes each and everything else is just over the phone or by email. That hip flexor stretch would not improve your performance on Fader or Faber. There is one other stretch, which is to lie on your back and do this. I know there are people in the world out there who are so stiff in their hips that they can't do this, but this is not actually a hard stretch. If achieving this position is difficult, you have a very long road to travel to consider yourself having maxed out on your hip mobility training. But if you're following the PHT protocol, this is already good and we can just make you hold this position for longer. But this is not adequate training, stretching, strengthening of anything in your hips. There is much more to progress and it's not mentioned in the PHT protocol. And many people with a hip impingement diagnosis find it difficult to squat deeply. They feel like things are pinching in their hips when they get down low. The PHT solution to that problem is to tell you not to squat deeply. There are no exercises to improve your ability to create hip flexion, meaning there are no hamstring stretches at all in this program. Just imagine I told you that I wanted to be better at push-ups, but right now, whenever I do push-ups, I hit this point where it feels like I'm just stuck and I'm not strong enough and it kind of hurts and pinches and jams. If you told me, well, Matt, that's because your bad bone shapes are preventing you from doing push-ups. You should never do any more push-ups. Then I would never ever make any more progress on my push-ups because I'm never training muscles to control the bones to allow me to get lower and lower and lower without feeling pain. Yeah, but if it's uncomfortable, it means you're damaging bones. No, it means you don't have the requisite muscle control. That means you're lacking strength and flexibility and coordination between all the muscles that control your arm and shoulder and the rest of your body as you descend and come back up. It doesn't mean that your bones are messed up. Which is why when you have trouble with hip flexion and going into a squat like this, an exercise program that starts with the assumption that you should just never do this because it's bad for you is really never gonna help you. If you're never doing anything to improve the flexibility of your posterior hip muscles, then you're never going to improve your hip flexion because you're ignoring a key piece of the puzzle. And that unfortunately is what the PHT does. What glute exercises are in there are just really easy, low level glute exercises exercises where you're just firing them in hip extension all the time and never working on being in hip flexion. There is one hamstring strength exercise where you stand on one leg with the knee slightly bent and you practice hinging at the hip and come back up. This is a strength exercise you could progress by holding on to weights of some kind, which is a great thing. But if you're somebody whose hamstrings are already stiff and tight and you have reduced range of motion and then you start throwing weight into it without proper coaching and without the right idea about trying to get more length in the hamstrings, then you're going to actually make yourself worse. And since the PHT tells you not to go into deep hip flexion because you'll be smashing bones, you're not actually gonna get more flexible and your hip flexion is just going to stay crappy. If you're somebody who's really flexible and bendy, loading this exercise with weight could actually be really helpful in strengthening your hamstrings at a lengthened position and giving you the control so that you can get into hip flexion without things feeling loosey-goosey. But when you look at number 15, you see that they don't even mention using weight in this exercise. So if you are somebody who could benefit from it, it's not even considered an option. Although I guess that could be included under etc. 
how you approach hip pain is gonna vary based on the individual in front of you. If somebody is very flexible, you're not gonna use the same set of exercises and the same techniques that you would use for somebody who's really stiff and tight and immobile. I've seen people with the FAI diagnosis and the FAI bone shapes who are extremely flexible and bendy and are able to go into a lot of different positions, but some of those positions are painful and feel like they're jamming or pinching something. On the other hand, there are other people with the FAI diagnosis and those bone shapes who are really stiff and inflexible. You don't use the same exercises in the same way for those people. It's also important to note that somebody who's really flexible and bendy with FAI bone shapes proves that the bone shapes are not the cause of the mobility issues. Wait, so you can have FAI bone shapes and be flexible or not flexible? Correct, and that reality is not acknowledged at all in the approach in this PHT protocol. You have a bunch of exercises that don't actually improve your hip mobility and are almost guaranteed to give you back pain or knee pain in the long run. So the big takeaway here is that it's actually incredible that any improvement at all happened for any of these patients given how crappy the protocol was. This non-surgical treatment started off with bad assumptions about bone shapes actually mattering, even though there's plenty of science to show that they don't. And despite multiple revisions, it still includes very questionable recommendations about using painkillers and steroid injections to manage your hip pain. And then it asks physical therapists with not enough time to do not enough sessions with hip pain patients with exercises that are totally inadequate and not geared towards actually helping the patient. Everything about this protocol hinges on the belief that the bone shapes matter and that handicapped the physical therapy protocol from the beginning all the way till the final draft. In the trial that compared this crappy PHT to surgery, surgery did actually do a little bit better for the patients. Reading the abstract, you might be led to believe that the surgery actually cured people's hip pain and really solved problems a lot better than this crappy protocol. But if you just read the abstract, you won't see these deeply problematic flaws in the way this trial was conducted. You mean there are more problems? Yeah, there were more problems than just this crappy physical therapy protocol, and I dive into it in depth in another video, which will be linked in the description box. And before we forget, we should mention that the PHT was also used in a randomized controlled trial in Australia, which unsurprisingly showed that the surgery did a little bit better than this crappy protocol. Is there anything researchers can do to really put a nail in the coffin of surgery? The best thing researchers can do is run a trial where they compare fake surgery to real surgery and see what the success rates really are. They've done this for knee meniscus surgeries, they've even done it for shoulder impingement surgeries, and they've found that the surgeries, whether real or fake, are equally effective. Wait, that means the sham surgery is just as good as the real surgery? Yes, the sham surgery has real results and the real surgery has real risks that can make you feel really bad, which will then make it feel like like you got scammed by a sham. I don't like being scammed. Neither do I. If surgery is not the answer, what are people supposed to do? ATM, always think muscles. Muscles move your bones, they are responsible for positioning your body in space, and they are what help you stabilize positions that right now might feel a little challenging. The only way to change your bone shapes is to have a surgeon go in and do it, and the satisfaction rates for that are not that good. Realize that the state-of-the-art treatments for hip pain are not that good right now. There's huge room for improvement in understanding and treatment of hip pain, and as long as orthopedic surgeons are driving that conversation and driving the development of physical therapy protocols to treat hip pain, you're gonna end up with crappy exercise protocols. So who can we trust? Very good question. You should look for hip mobility professionals. Look for people who help others move better. They don't have to be a physical therapist. They don't have to be a special kind of certified whatever. I am thrilled that there is currently a growing number of movement professionals of all stripes who are helping people move their hips better. It's not just me. I've seen them on Instagram. I've seen them on YouTube. Go find one that resonates with you. And if you can find one that is local to you, that is the absolute best thing you can do. So we should just trust people like you? Actually, let me make something really clear here. I don't want you to just put 100% faith into any random person who says they know everything about how the hips work. They should be critical thinkers who are trying to help you figure out what's gonna work best to restore strength and flexibility around your hips. They should not be cowed by orthopedic dogma that tells them that the bones are the problem. They need to have enough experience to know how to deal with muscles and how to help you figure things out. And if you feel like you're just spinning your wheels and you're getting the run around to 
your questions after three to six months, then you definitely want to remove your trust and give it to somebody else who seems like they deserve it. And definitely don't trust anybody who says you have to return for the rest of your life on a weekly basis just to maintain your hip health. The only reason you would need to see a practitioner for long periods of time is because you feel like you need the accountability and or you're still making progress on different things because you got a lot of stuff that's gumming up your hips. I personally don't do any in-person group or one-on-one -on -one sessions because I don't have the time and energy. I'm focused on raising a kid and handling parents who are aging and on their way to the end of life. Maybe in the future I'll start doing sessions and you can stay abreast of updates like that by going to my website at uprighthealth.com. What if I can't find anybody I trust? If you can't find somebody you trust, I would recommend you go to my website at uprighthealth.com slash DIY. On that page, you will see the Healthy Hips program and the FAI Fix program. Both of those would be good options to help you start improving your hip mobility. And if you don't have hip issues, then you can check out the other programs that deal with back pain or shoulder pain or hunchback posture. And you can also pick a free self-massage program while you're there. So is that all? No, that's not all. I also want to remind you to be patient. This will be a process. So if you're in so much pain that you've been considering hip surgery, know that you are going to have a lot of ups and downs and there will be trial and error involved in restoring your hip mobility. Educate yourself so that you're mentally prepared for the journey ahead. I'm going to leave a bunch of links to resources that'll help you for free and they're all going to be in the description box. I've also got more free videos to help you right here. Support this channel using the PayPal or Patreon links you'll find below or the join and thanks buttons on YouTube. Like, share, and subscribe with the bell notification on. And as always, I hope you remember that pain sucks, life shouldn't.